Okay, let's get started. All right, so exam Monday. It's open book, open note, open lab manual, everything open except computers, electronic devices, and your mouse. Okay? Um, it'll be the same format as the last exam except shorter because you only have the class time to do it. Um, so it'll have the two sections. You'll have a choice of questions in each section. We encourage you to do all of the questions because your best scores will count. Um, it will be not cumulative. That is, anything that was tested on the first exam will not be repeated on the second exam. So this exam is only on material that was covered since the first exam. Any questions before we start reviewing? OK. Um, oh, and one other thing. Uh, presentations and review in lab tomorrow, everyone's expected to attend. OK. Um, we'll do this the way we did last time, so just uh, start asking questions and I'll start answering them. Question four from March 22nd. This one? Is it okay if we do the previous one first? Okay. So this is a question basically about basic genetic principles, okay? And the question goes, um, consider the following experiment. A set of hybrid offspring is produced from a cross between a red flowered and a white flowered plant. Um, assume that the flower color difference is due to a single gene and that the red allele of this gene is dominant to the white allele, okay? The question is what color flowers will the hybrids have? So let's say, um, we have these two alleles, big R and little r. Okay, so uh, this would be the red allele. This would be the white allele. Okay, and what we're told is that the cross is between a red flowered and a white flower variety of a plant. So when you say variety, it means that you know anytime you can go to the garden shop and get that variety, it's always going to be red if it's a red variety. If it's, it's always going to be white if it's a white variety. So that suggests you're going to be dealing with no heterozygous plants. It's, they're going to be homozygous, either big R, big R, or little r, little r. And so the cross you do is between the big R, big R, and the little r, little r, um, because you're crossing a red variety plant with a white variety plant. Okay? And so the question is, what color flowers will the hybrids have? So the hybrids, what's the genotype of the hybrids between these two when I cross them together? What's this? Big R, little r. Okay, and what color flowers will they have? Red, because that's dominant. Okay, and so um, the next question is if the hybrids are crossed to one another, what proportion of their offspring will have red flowers and what proportion will have white flowers? So then what we're doing is we're doing this cross, right? Okay, and that gives us um, a bunch of possibilities. So this parent is going to make two different types of gametes, big R gametes and little r gametes. This parent, likewise, is going to make big R gametes or little r gametes. And so there are actually four possibilities. <coughs> big R, little r, oh, sorry. Big R, big R, big R, little r, little r, big r, and little r, little r, OK? Um, those are the possible offspring you get from crossing these two parents, because you get one allele from each parent. And these will be in equal proportions, because there's a 50-50 chance of getting big R or little r from each parent. Okay, so this is one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. And what color flowers will these plants have? Red, 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 white. Okay, so then we have three quarters of these and one quarter of these. Okay, so that's that question. Well, I mean, usu usually when we, so when we get used to questions like this, we just treat them the same. And I would say there's going to be one of these, two of those, and one of those, okay? Yeah, I mean, the reason I wrote it this way is because that makes very clear what the proportions are of all these things, right? These are as represented as those. It's not like you lose half of them, 
Okay, so this question advertised as difficult, right? Um, basically the same experiment, except now assume that instead of one gene contributing to the flower color, there are 10 genes, okay? And for each of these 10 genes, there are two alleles, um, a red allele found in the red variety and a white allele found in the white variety. So same setup. And assume that for each gene, the red allele is dominant to the white allele. Okay, so then the question is, in the offspring of the hybrid plant, so basically the setup is the same, except now we have, instead of just big R, big R, we have big R1, big R1, big R2, big R2, and so on, all the way up to 10, right? We have 10 genes that contribute to this trait, and so we have like that. And each one is going to behave like this, right? And so the question is, in the offspring of the hybrid plants, what proportion of them will have white flowers? So in order to, for them to have white flowers, they basically have to have this genotype, okay? They have to have all little r's, because if any one of these has a big r, that's dominant, and you get a red flower, okay? So this is the only way to get a white flowered plant, right? So basically what we have to calculate is how many of the progeny of these hybrids, which, which again are heterozygous for all 10 of these genes. In the progeny of these hybrids, how many of them will have this genotype? Okay, that's basically the question, right? And so we can break it down, and we already have break it, broken it down, that's why I wanted to go through this example first, for each one separately. So for this one, just, just the gene number one, three quarters of the progeny are going to have at least one big R allele, and one quarter of the progeny are going to have the two little R alleles. Okay. So the same thing is going to be true for the second gene, right? So again, you're going to have three quarter that have at least one big R allele, and one quarter that are little r, little r. And so if we just had these two genes instead of 10 genes, we could calculate the probability that we get this genotype, okay? And that probability is just 1 quarter times 1 quarter, okay? And the reason for that is that the way to think about it is in order for this genotype to be that, then the the progeny plant had to get R1 from each parent, the little R1 from each parent, and the little R2 from each parent. The probability of getting the little R1 from this parent is a half. The probability of getting the little R1 from this parent is a half. The probability of getting the little R2 from this parent is a half. And the probability of getting the little R2 from this parent is a half. So basically, to get those alleles, there's a one half chance for each of them. and so. These are all independent events, so we multiply the probabilities. It's like if you flip two coins, the probability of getting two heads is a quarter, right? So the probability of getting R1 and R1, little R1 and little R1 is a quarter. The probability of getting little R2 and little R2 is a quarter. So the overall probability if there are only two genes contributing to the trait is instead of one quarter of the flowers being white, one sixteenth of the flowers are going to be white, or the plants are going to have white flowers, right? Everyone with me so far? Okay, so this tells us how to solve the problem for any number of genes contributing to the trait. It's basically one quarter times one quarter times as many genes as we have, one quarter. Okay, so in this example, we have 10 genes. So basically, we have one quarter times 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 one quarter. Times one quarter right? And so you can calculate that on a calculator, and it's about one in a million. Okay, we shorthand write that as one quarter to the tenth power, okay? And if you compute that, it's basically around one in a million. And the reason I, I wanted to assign this question is because um, during that time in the course, we were talking about marker-assisted breeding, for example, and how if you have markers for genes that contribute to particular traits, you can save a lot of time and space by um, testing the seedling's DNA instead of having to grow up the plants and see what color flowers they have, for example. So imagine you wanted to create this plant with white flowers out of this cross. You would have to plant a million seeds at least to get that one plant, right? 
And so if you had to grow up all of those plants, you would have a million plants to water and make sure the sunlight hits and all that. But if you just have your greenhouse and you have all these tiny little seedlings and you can do your DNA tests, then you can find the one that's going to be the right plant without having to go through all that trouble. And then that's the only plant you would then grow up. OK, does that make sense? Next question. Question one, um, why do mutations of mitochondrial genes so often cause human disease? If your father suffers from such a disease, what's the probability that you will inherit it? Um, so mitochondria, as you recall, are um, these little organelles within your cells. Um, their, ba their job basically is to produce energy. Okay, And so um, they have their own little genome because they started out as a bacterium that got swallowed by a primitive eukaryotic cell, right? And so um, you have this basically symbiotic uh, organelle within your cells. Um, now it's completely dependent on the cells. It couldn't go, you, you know, you couldn't go plate uh, mitochondria on an auger plate and expect them to grow or anything. They're not bacteria anymore. Um, and one of the reasons they can't grow on their own is because they have this very, very reduced genome. And the only genes in their genome are basically devoted to their function, which is creating energy. Um, and so uh, the question then is, why do mutations of mitochondrial genes cause disease? The reason is that there are lots of aspects of your physiology that require energy. Okay, And mitochondrial diseases tend to affect the parts of you that require the most energy. Okay, And so um, if you remember from that lecture, I showed a slide of the map of the mitochondria and the different genes and what kinds of diseases they were associated with. And the most common types of diseases were uh, muscle problems, okay, myopathies, right? And, and that makes a lot of sense because every, every time you contract a muscle, you're using energy, okay? And so if your mitochondria are not functioning properly, then you don't have that energy and your muscles can't contract. And that's not just you know, lifting weights or running a long distance, but that's basically everyday life, you know, you're getting your muscles to work. Um, and so it can cause some pretty debilitating diseases. The second part of the question, if your father suffers some, from such a disease, what is the probability that you will inherit? The, the, the other um, important feature of mitochondria, because they're, they're organelles sitting in the cytoplasm, um, they divide within the cytoplasm. They're completely separate from the nucleus. And um, eggs, approximately to scale, are about this big. And sperm are about this big. Okay, um, And so eggs have a lot of cytoplasm in them. And sperm have basically no cytoplasm in them. So when a sperm fertilizes an egg, the, the genes from the two parents come together. And you have an equal representation of genes from each parent from the regular nucleus. But the cytoplasm is pretty much all from the mother. Okay? And so that means the mitochondria are pretty much all from the mother. So mitochondria trace maternal lineages. Everyone has them. I have them. Every XY person in this room has one, has them. But they don't pass them on. Okay? And so the probability that if someone's father suffers from a mitochondrial DNA disease, um, the, their probability of inheriting the disease is zero because they only get their mitochondria from their mother. Yes. Yes. All right, second question is Draw the evolutionary tree you would have expected to see if North American dogs were domesticated from North American gray wolves instead of being descendants of Eurasian dogs. So remember, one of the reasons we were talking about mitochondria is because they are useful for tracing lineages. Okay? And so the example that we talked about was figuring out where dogs come from, you know, what, their, what their wild ancestor was and, and what part of the world that happened in. And so we used those sequences from the dogs and wolves mitochondrial DNA to figure that out. And basically, the answer is that the, the nearest living relative of all dogs is wolves. Okay? 
Um, and so it's very, that basically means that dogs were domesticated from a wolf. Um, and in particular, you can look at similarities between different wolves' DNA and different dogs' DNA and ask the question, well, did it happen in a particular part of the world? Um, was there one particular strain of wolves that gave rise to all dogs? Um, and the answer from that analysis was basically that it was hard to tell the difference, in fact, just by looking at the mitochondrial DNA between a wolf and a dog. Okay? In fact, some, uh, some dogs, like there was one example of a German Shepherd that had mitochondrial DNA sequence that was basically identical to a gray wolf sequence. Okay? And other wolves had slightly different sequences, other dogs had slightly different sequences. But if you drew the tree of relationships between all those organisms, basically what you would see um, would be, say, a tree that looked like this, right? And there would be wolves and dogs sort of interspersed with one another, okay? And so um, that's true even if you sort of separate out not just dogs, but you say North American dog breeds, okay? We talked about some of the sort of crazy looking Native American dog breeds, right, that are evident from archeological evidence. Um, if you separate North American dog breeds from Eurasian do dog breeds, and if you separate North American wolves from Eurasian wolves, you still get this pattern, suggesting that um, those populations were pretty well mixed. Okay? Now the question is, well, what if it weren't like that? What if um, North American wolves were separate from Eurasian wolves, and there were separate domestication events, so that in North America, people created dogs out of wolves, and in Eurasia, people created dogs out of wolves, and they were separate. Then the tree that you would get would be something that looks like this. Where you would have wolves, and these would be, say, the Eurasian wolves, and these would be the North American wolves. And then um, sort of coming out of that part of the tree, you would have a bunch of dogs. And these would be the Eurasian dogs. And these here would be the North American dogs. Okay? And if you saw a pattern like that, then you could infer that there were basically two separate domestication events, one that happened in North America and one that happened in Eurasia. Okay? But the real tree is more like this, where they're all just interspersed. Um, why does it go here, you mean? Right, so the way to track back here is um, any point where branches meet, you can rotate it like this, and it doesn't change the, the actual relationships, right? So you could draw this same thing, but flip it over, and the wolves would be down here, and the dogs would be here. Okay. Um, so basically, the way we measure sort of time, which was your question, is we just sort of count back to the branch point um, that connects those things. So this is a very short distance in time, and this is a longer distance in time, and this is an even longer distance in time. No, because um, if you just take this point here and rotate everything around it, okay, then you'd get from that point you would get um, dogs and wolves, right? That's what that's what it looked like, okay. And again, just because these D's are now closer to these D's, it doesn't change the distance back in time you have to go to their common ancestor. Okay, that's the really relevant thing is when their common ancestor was. And their common ancestor, no matter whether it's rotated this way or this way, was here. So, yeah, so you can pretty much ask for any two animals on this tree when their common ancestor was, right? So let's say I care about this one and this one, right? 
then I have to sort of follow the line back and back forward again to get sort of the root between these two, and that means their common ancestor was this far back in time. So, so time is going back in this direction, right? Whereas if I said this dog and this dog, then I only have to go back a little bit in time to find their common ancestor. Um, but basically, any, any, if you select sort of any one of the animals down here and any one of the animals down up here, then their common ancestor is here. Any other questions about this? All right, next one. This one? OK, so the question is, what types of evidence were used to demonstrate that green revolution varieties of rice have a mutant SD1 gene? OK, so the green revolution, right, was this time sort of around the middle of last century. Um, when yields of crops started going up, that is the amount of product you get per unit area went up. And the major uh, advance there was that um, the plants that were grown were sort of these short, stocky varieties, dwarf varieties. Okay? And, the, and the reason that was an advantage is that, th that those would hold up better under various environmental conditions, wind and rain and so on. The, the, the seeds of wheat or rice would stay on the plant, um, and the plant could tolerate that without falling over. Okay, so these short, stocky varieties were stronger plants, and they also devoted le less of the plant to just sort of stalks and leaves that don't actually end up on your plate or as food. Right, More, a b greater percentage of the plant is actually food when you have a short, stocky plant because all the seeds are just taking up more room. Um, so. That's basically the green revolution. And, and the reason those, those plants were able to have more seeds was a combination of breeding to make them produce more seeds and the widespread use, in particular, of nitrogen fertilizer. Okay? Lots of chemicals added. And if you just add chemicals to the old varieties of wheat and rice, then those plants couldn't take it. They would start growing, but then they'd, get, they'd fall over under their own weight. So that was the Green Revolution. And this gene, SD1, was basically um, the canonical gene that mutated in order to give those short, stocky varieties. SD stands for semi-dwarf, okay, short, stocky plant. And um, it was only recently, actually, that this gene, in terms of its DNA sequence, was actually identified, right? And so once a, a group of researchers said, OK, I think it's this DNA sequence that is the SD1 gene that's causing these plants to be short and stocky, then they have to do experiments to actually prove it. Okay? And so that's what this question is about. What evidence do you bring to bear on this question, whether this particular gene, this particular sequence of DNA, is what's responsible for these plants being short and stocky? Okay? And so um, there are three lines of evidence that are, usually, that are brought to bear in this case, and, and usually there have to be at least two. Okay? So the first line of evidence is that when you look at that DNA sequence, it's different between this new variety, the semi-dwarf variety, and the old variety. Okay, that's a definite prerequisite for this gene to be the cause of this change. Right? If there was no difference in the DNA sequences of that gene between the semi-dwarf variety and the previous variety, then there's no way that that got mutated and caused this, this difference. Okay, does that make sense? Right, so that has to be piece of evidence number one. And in this case, sure enough, you can get that evidence, that the SD1 gene is different in the green revolution varieties of wheat or rice than the, the parental varieties, the pre-existing varieties. Okay? But that's not proof in and of itself, because we, as we've discussed a number of times, mutations happen all the time. DNA sequences between individuals of the same species differ at many locations just by chance. Most of those la locations have nothing to do with the function of the organism. We have three million DNA differences between us. Most of them don't matter at all. Okay? 
And so just showing that that sequence of that gene is different between the two varieties doesn't prove that that's why the plants look different. In order to prove that the plants look different, you actually have to do a functional test. And in the case of SD1, two tests were done. The first test was that it was recognized that the DNA sequence of this particular gene, just by looking at the se sequence, you could tell that it was an enzyme of a particular kind, and that enzyme was involved in producing a plant hormone called gibberellin. Okay? And so the inference that was made is that in these uh, dwarf varieties of wheat or rice, um, gibberellin synthesis was messed up, so you didn't get as much gibberellin. And because that's a plant growth hormone, you have less gibberellin, and so you have a shorter plant. Okay. And so the test you can do then is to take these mutant plants, these green revolution plants, and add gibberellin. You basically just, in, while you're watering the plant, you add that hormone. Okay. And lo and behold, when you do that, you bypass the need for that gene because you're giving them gibberellin instead of forcing them to make gibberellin themselves, and the plants grow tall. Okay, so that's a, a kind of evidence that was specific to this gene because something was understood about what its likely function was. But then the real definitive test is one you can do for every gene, okay, independent of what function it might serve. And that test is to take the version of the gene that wasn't mutated and put it into the plant that has the gene mutated. Okay, so you take these semi-dwarf varieties of, of wheat or rice, you take the gene from the previous variety that grows tall, just that gene, you put it into the semi-dwarf plant and it grows tall. Okay, so that the only difference between the real semi-dwarf plant and this engineered plant is that single gene. And if indeed you get it, those plants to grow tall, then you have definitive evidence that that gene is the cause of that phenotypic difference. Okay? And you can do that with any type of gene. And, and I gave you another example that had to do with tomatoes. Okay? So there are tomatoes that are round and then there are tomatoes that are pear-shaped. Right? The pear-shaped ones has a, have a mutation in a certain gene. And if you take the gene from the round variety of tomato and you put it into a plant that would normally generate pear-shaped tomatoes, those tomatoes become round. Okay? Same type of experiment. And that's definitive evidence that that gene causes the difference. All right? Yeah, so, so, so the shorter plants have a mutated SD1 gene, and you take the normal gene from the tall plant and just put that gene into the shorter plants, and you get the tall plant. March 29th, number one. Okay, so the question here is... Um, predict the phenotypic consequences on japonica rice of a mutation in the promoter of its waxy gene that leads to higher transcriptional activity of the gene. Predict the phenotypic consequences on glutinous rice of a mutation in the promoter of its waxy gene that leads to higher transcriptional activity of the gene. Okay, so here basically what you, it's a very similar type of experiment. Basically you're saying um, these types of rice differ because of something about their waxy genes. And so the question is, what happens if you, um, if you sort of experimentally alter the activity of that gene? What do you expect to happen in terms of what the rice will look like? And so in order to answer this question, you have to know something about japonica rice, glutinous rice, um, in comparison to indica rice. Okay? And so the way to remember these things is that you have sort of a spectrum of um, stickiness. right? So you have indica rice, which are your normal uh, long grain rice. You have japonica rice, which is your normal short grain rice, like sushi rice. Um, and then you have glutinous rice, which is really sticky and basically used for desserts. Okay? And so you have this sort of spectrum of stickiness here. And what makes these things um, different is what type of starch they have and in what proportions. Okay? And so if you review the lecture material from that lecture, um, you'll see that glutinous rice is 100% of a particular starch called amylopectin. Right? Um, and 
basically what you have going this way is a reverse spectrum of how much amylopectin is there. Okay? So japonica rice has sort of high levels of amylopectin, but not 100%. And indica rice has low levels of amylopectin. Um, not 0%, but not nowhere near 100%. So amylopectin is a starch, right? And then the other starch that's sort of the, the reciprocal of this. So indica rice is high in amylose. Okay. Japonica rice is low in amylose. Okay. And glutinous rice has no amylose. Okay, so it's basically the balance of these two starches that makes the difference between how sticky these different types of rice are. Um, and you can look back at the lecture, but the, the basic difference is that they're both made up of glucose, but it depends how you organize the glucose. So amylose is just a long polymer of glucose, and then amylopectin is branched, and it's that branch structure that makes it sticky. Um, but that's not particularly important to this question. Um, what's important to this question is what role the waxy gene um, plays in, um, in the production of the different starches. Okay? And so the waxy gene encodes an enzyme that's a starch synthase. Okay? And that enzyme, which you call waxy, okay, basically shifts the balance towards making amylose. Okay, So the reason glutinous rice is 100% amylopectin is that it has a defective waxy gene. Okay, Because you need waxy to make glucose into amylose. And if you don't have waxy, all that glucose basically gets converted into amylopectin. Okay, You can think of it as sort of a fork in the road. right? And one direction is amylose, the other direction is amylopectin. Right? And normally, you know, cars will sort of choose whichever way they go, and some of them will go this way, and some of them will go this way. But if you have a block in the road that says nobody can go in the direction of amylose, then everybody goes towards amylopectin. Okay? And that's why glutinous rice is 100% amylopectin. So then the question is, well, predict what happens if you take um, japonica rice and you make its waxy gene more active. Um, and in particular, m you make it transcribed more. Okay, so what do you think will happen if you, if you make the waxy gene of japonica rice more active? Yeah, you'll make more amylose instead of amylopectin, right? And so you'll get a less sticky rice. And the reason is that the mutation that is in um, the japonica rice that makes it have low amylose and, and basically low activity of waxy is not in the coding sequence of the gene. It's because it doesn't make enough of the transcript of that gene. So you don't get enough of that enzyme. So you can artificially engineer it to make more. The enzyme is perfectly fine when you do make it. And that's what shifts the balance towards making amylose and getting a rice that's more similar to this. So the, the the other part of the question is, well, what happens if you do that with glutinous rice? Okay. Now, if the mutation in glutinous rice that basically inactivated the waxy gene was one where it wasn't transcribed enough, then the same result would happen. You would make it transcribed more. You would get more waxy enzyme. You would shift the balance from amylopectin to amylose, and you would get a less sticky rice. Okay. But that's not what happened. And the reason that doesn't happen is that that's not the kind of mutation that happened in the glutinous rice. So if you look back to your lecture notes from this lecture, I tell you what kind of mutation happened in glutinous rice. And it's not a mutation of the waxy gene that makes it transcribed less. It's actually a mutation that makes it spliced improperly. So the introns don't get taken out properly. And when introns don't get taken out properly, you get a, the wrong protein. And when you get the wrong protein, you don't have the enzyme. Okay? So the reason this is 100% amylopectin is because this enzyme is not made at all. And it's not made at all not because the gene is not transcribed, but because the transcripts are wrong. Does that make sense? 
So then the question is, well, if you make more transcripts, what will happen? And the answer is nothing, right? If the transcripts are wrong, it doesn't matter how many of them you make. They're still wrong, OK? And so you can't convert glutinous rice into something less sticky by making this gene more active, or at least the gene it has. Okay. You could take the waxy gene from indica rice and put it into glutinous rice, and then you would get less sticky rice, because that would be the right gene. All right. Okay. Next question. This one? <coughs> okay, so the question is draw a schematic of how the first DNA sequence below can mutate in one step into the second DNA sequence below. So the first thing you notice is that these two sequences are of different length, right? It's not that just one base is changing to another base, okay? The length is changing somehow. So somehow we have to break that down. And I'm going to try and do this first without writing anything. Um, because just like a DNA polymerase, if I try writing these sequences down, I'll probably make a mistake. And the reason I'll probably make a mistake when I try and write it is there are so many repeats in there. You know, it goes CAG, CAG, GAG, CAG, CAG, GAG. And when you're writing a sequence like that, it's hard to keep track of it and make sure you get it right. Okay? And that's exactly the same thing that happens when a DNA polymerase enzyme tries to copy that sequence. It forgets which repeat it's on. And, and what I mean by forgetting, you'll see in a second. So the first thing we need to diagnose is what the actual difference is between this sequence and this sequence. Okay? So if we start at this end, they both start out the same, AAG, AAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, CAG, CAG, GAG. So now we're up to here and here. And then CAG, CAG, GAG, right? And then this one ends AAG, but this one does another repeat. It goes CAG, CAG, GAG, and then AAG, right? So the difference is basically that this sequence, the CAG, CAG, GAG, in the top sequence is repeated twice, okay? And in the bottom sequence is repeated three times, okay? So now I'm going to make my job easier because instead of drawing that whole sequence, I'm just going to draw a box that refers to CAG, CAG, GAG, okay? So the top sequence is AAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, AAG. Right? Does everyone agree? Everyone get my notation here? Okay. And the bottom sequence is AAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, CAG, CAG, GAG, AAG. Okay? Two repeats, three repeats. And the question is, how does this mutate into this? And the answer is that the DNA polymerase, when it's replicating this DNA, is going to make a mistake, and it's going to go back and copy one of these twice. Okay? And so we can draw that. Um, and the, the best way to do it is actually to also include the complementary sequence. So this is you know, it's double-stranded DNA. It's a double helix. Okay? And so... We can show both strands of that helix, right? And so we have a, a five prime end and a three prime end and a three prime end and a five prime end, okay? And so that's that double helix paired to itself, right? And so what happens when a piece of DNA is copied, right, is these two strands separate and each one gets copied, right? And so what we want to keep track of is, is say, copying this bottom strand into a new strand, okay? And so if we have 3 prime TTC and then repeat, repeat TTC 5 prime, okay? 
the DNA polymerase is going to come along and it's going to be synthesizing this strand A, A, G. It's going to copy that repeat. It might copy this repeat. And then what's possible is that instead of continuing, it sort of backs up. Okay? And you can imagine that then this sequence, which is complementary to this sequence, is also complementary to this sequence. Right? And so what can happen, and I'll just draw it in blue, is that this pairs now here. Okay? So it sort of slides that way. And this brown box, which used to be here, now just sort of loops out. Okay? So you have something that looks like that. So in this copy, okay, we went from it all being in register to now having AAG, one repeat, another repeat, and then we still have copying to do. Okay? And so uh, once it gets to this stage, the DNA polymerase is going to keep going, and so it knows it has to copy that, and then it has to copy this. Okay, so this new strand of DNA now has three repeats. Okay, and when that get cop gets copied, if that gets copied faithfully, then you'll have that second sequence down there. Okay, you'll have a regular double helix that's that sequence and its complement. So that you could also think about how you would go from something with three repeats back to something with two repeats. Okay, and it's a very similar process that happens, except instead of the, the strand that's in the process of actually being synthesized going backwards, it's this strand, the one that's being copied, that loops out. And so this repeat, for example, might just get skipped. And if that repeat gets skipped, then you're down to one repeat left. Okay? And it's this kind of copying error that happens that makes the Huntington gene go back and forth in terms of the number of repeats. So you have some people with 30 repeats of it, some people with 80 repeats, some people with 100 repeats. It's because these sequences are really hard to copy and they, they make these mistakes like this. So I don't know if this is going to help, but I'm going to try. So imagine that these are the two repeats in the original sequence. Okay. So basically what happens is the copy starts being made, so, so this repeat gets copied, okay? And then this repeat gets copied, right? And if everything was normal, it would just keep going and then you'd be done, okay? But these repeats are exactly the same sequence, so what can happen instead is that this sequence can actually pair with this one, okay? Now this is not complementary to what's here, right? Because that would be like AAG or something. So instead, and, and the sequence that would be here is complementary to here. Okay, so instead of just shifting everything, what happens is this black one sort of just loops out, right? And then everything else is perfectly aligned. This matches with this, and whatever sequence is at the beginning, that AAG matches with what it's supposed to match with. And so the only sort of blip in the, in the whole s system is that this thing is sort of like that. Sort of. So um, when you have this situation, um, it doesn't last like this. So you don't have sort of sitting in your cells a looped out piece of DNA. What happens is this will get copied again. And so this copy will now have two repeats, and this copy will be three repeats, but there would be no loops in those. Oh, okay. so, oh, so, okay. so the difference is just in how many repeats there are in any particular copy of the gene. Yeah, so what happens when this is copied is these just separate from one another. One another. So there's no more loops anymore. They're just sort of strands of spaghetti. Right. And then what actually causes the disease like Huntington's is that the proteins that are made 
have lots of amino acids that are all the same right in a row. And those amino acids cause the proteins to tangle up and get stuck in nerve cells and so on and cause damage. When, it, when the number of repeats increases, it's the new version that loops out. And when the number of repeats decreases, it's the old version that loops out. Because if you think about this one looping out, then it would sort of ride right over it. And you'd get TTC copied, and then one repeat, and then another TTC copied. And so you'd be left with only one repeat. That's the kind of thing that it's probably worthwhile to take 15 minutes at home and draw it out yourself, you know, and make sure you understand that. Next question. So the repeat contains the GAG already, because it's CAG, CAG, GAG is the repeat unit, right? Oh, okay, okay. Any other questions about this one? Okay, next question. What are the relative advantages and disadvantages of studying the following model organisms? Right? And then what are the advantages and disadvantages of studying non-model organisms such as the three spines of pickleback? Okay, so fruit fly, why do people study fruit flies? They study them because they have a very quick generation time, 10 days from egg to adult, okay? Which basically means you can do genetics. You can do crosses, you can do crosses after those crosses and crosses after those crosses. And it happens very quickly. Um, and so um, it's a lot faster, for example, than mice, which take months to mature. Right? Um, another advantage of, of flies is that they're very easy to rear. Okay? And this is a practical concern, but it can make a big difference. Right? Uh, you feed them basically uh, porridge with some agar in it so it's solid. Uh, it's very easy to make. It's cheap. The flies love it. Um, you can. You can feed hundreds of them in a vial the size of like this, basically. Okay, So you can keep large numbers of them in a small space. Um, it didn't have to be this way, but it turned out that flies have a relatively compact genome also. Uh, we've talked about how junk-filled our own genome is. A very small percentage of our genome is actually genes, whereas in the fly, a much larger percentage of the genome is genes. That makes it easier to study. You don't have to wade through all this garbage to find the interesting bits of the genome. Um, so those are the, the major advantages of flies. The nematode worm, C. elegans, is very similar in its advantages. Um, instead of a 10-day generation time, it has like a three-day generation time from egg to adult. Okay, So you can do genetics that much quicker with worms. Um, it also has a very compact genome. The, the major additional advantage of worms is that they're transparent their entire life. And what that means is that you can actually track their development while they're alive under a microscope and see every cell in their body, basically. Whereas a fruit fly or something like us, um, you can't do that. The main disadvantage of worms is that they're, um, and flies is that there are some aspects of their physiology that aren't analogous to ours. Okay, So if, for example, what you're interested in studying is our immune system, flies and worms don't have the equivalent of our adaptive immune system. They don't make antibodies. Um, they don't have cellular immunity. And, and they don't sort of, you can't vaccinate them in the same way you can vaccinate us because they have cells that remember past infections. They don't have that. Okay, So you can't study certain processes in worms and flies that you can study in us. And that's why uh, there are vertebr vertebrate model systems that are used um, because they're closer to us. So fish and mice are commonly used because they're vertebrates, 
They have similar immune systems to us. They have similar nervous systems to us. In many aspects, they're much more similar to us. Um, the disadvantages is that their generation times are longer. They're harder to rear in large numbers. But you can tell by which species were chosen to study that those those disadvantages people were trying to minimize as much as possible. So. Uh, um, Zebrafish, for example, are tiny little fish. You can raise a lot of them in one tank. Um, they reproduce fairly quickly. They're also transparent in their early developmental stages, and they have external fertilization, unlike mice. So mice, like us, have internal fertilization. But fish often have external fertilization, so you can get eggs and sperm of fish, mix them together in a dish, and watch the embryos grow up under the microscope, basically, whereas you can't do that in a, in a mouse. Um, Mice are advantageous because they're even closer related to us. They're mammals, OK? So um, in many, many, many respects, mice have the same physiology as us. And, and for 100, 100 years or so, they've been studied as a genetic model organism. Zebrafish has a gigantic genome. It's bigger than our genome, or about the size of our genome. So um, it's hard to study. Pufferfish are hard to raise in large numbers. They're not a great laboratory organism. In fact, they can kill you. Um, but they have a tiny genome for a vertebrate. Um, their genome is about the tenth of the size of ours. Okay, And so that's why pufferfish are studied. Um, mice have a genome approximately the size of ours. Um, but the advantage of theirs is that they're so closely related to us that you can basically just sort of align their genome with our genome, and all the genes are there in the same order for the most part. Um, it's very easy to say, OK, this gene in mouse is the same as this gene, gene in human. And that's harder to do the more evolutionarily distant the organisms are that you're studying. Um, so that's sort of the range of advantages and disadvantages for those organisms. Um, why would you study a three-spine stickleback or other non-model organisms? The reasons come down to what biological questions you're interested in. Okay, If you're interested in ecology, evolution, adaptation to changing environments, um, you need to study an organism that has experienced that. Um, and so sticklebacks are a model organism for sort of um, uh, adapting to a, a new environment. We talked about how the glacial ice sheets receded at the end of the ice age, revealing all of these uh, uh, lakes and streams near the coasts. Um, and those were new habitats that these fish can invade. And then they adapt to, and they become very different fish. And so people who are trying to understand that process of adapting to a new environment want to study something like sticklebacks as opposed to something like a mouse, which didn't have that. All right. Yeah. OK. So this one's back to dogs. Um, the question is, there's this article that I had you read um, that talks about these two breeds that um, were supposed to be ancient breeds, the pharaoh hound um, from Egypt and the Norwegian elk hound. And I showed you like the Wikipedia entry for the Norwegian elk hound talking about it as this like uh, wonderful creature that existed for thousands of years, that the Vikings revered and all this business. Um, but then when the DNA test came in, um, it was bad news because uh, it looked like a modern dog breed. It didn't look like an ancient breed that's been around for a long time. Um, and so one of the scientists um, who was quoted in that article said, well, you know, yeah, it's a possibility that those breeds are actually modern recreations, basically that um, someone liked the look of those Egyptian dogs that they saw on uh, on uh, pieces of art and sculpture. People liked the mythology of, of the ancient uh, uh, Vikings and, and, and wanted their dogs. And so some modern breeders, some point uh, in the recent but not too recent past, decided to basically recreate these, those breeds by selecting the same traits okay, and making a dog that looked very much like those ancient dogs. Um, and so that's a possibility that the DNA evidence would support because the DNA says they look like all of the modern breeds that we know that were basically created during the Victorian era. Um, but uh, there's the other possibility, which is what this quote is, which is that uh, equally consistent with the genetics is that there's an unbroken line from antiquity, 
but there, but there has been enough mixing with other breeds along the way that the ancient signature is too faint to see. So the question is, what does he mean by this statement? And if there has been that kind of mixing, why do the Faroe Hounds and the Norwegian Elk Hounds look so similar to the ancient remains from Egypt and Norway? So it's sort of a paradox, right? So if this is a valid explanation, you have to resolve this paradox. The paradox is that the one way the DNA could be true, but the breed can be ancient, is if that DNA was coming from modern breeds that intermixed in more recent times with the ancient breed that had been existing all the way since antiquity. Um, and so that can happen. As you know, you know, sir, if you don't keep your eye on your dog, things can happen, right? So um, there could have been intermixing of these sort of purebred ancient dog lineages with more modern breeds in more recent times. Um, and then that, that could give you the same genetic signature because the, it could be that the DNA that was tested was the part of the genome that came from these more modern bred dogs instead of the part that was preserved from antiquity. Okay? So that's part of the explanation. But then the question is, well, if there's been so much mixing that if you take DNA out of that dog, it looks modern then why do the dogs still look ancient, right? Because if you think about it, if you, if you let your poodle mate with a German Shepherd, you don't get a German Shepherd out, and you don't get a poodle out, OK? You get some mutt, right? And if you breed mutts together, you get more mutts, OK? So how is it that these elk hounds and these fair hounds, if there has been this kind of mixing, still look like elk hounds and fair hounds? Um, and, and the way we have to resolve that um, that paradox is to say that natural selection or artificial selection are really strong forces. That is that if someone chooses that what they want to see is something very much looking like a pharaoh hound, even if it's been mixed with other breeds, um, and they continually say, I want to take the dog that looks, looks most like this typical pharaoh hound, they're going to be successful. Okay? And the reason is that um, selection is really powerful. So the way you imagine it is that there's this pharaoh hound breed existing since the antiquity. It starts mixing with more modern breeds. But every time one of these cross matings happens, um, someone intentionally says, I'm going to pick the pups that are most pharaoh hound like. Okay? And if it doesn't look like a pharaoh hound, then we're not going to call it a pharaoh hound anymore. We'll give it away to the neighbors, you know, whatever. Okay? And so as long as you keep selecting on those traits and you keep saying, I want the dogs that have that curved tail and the pointed snout and the, and the really narrow waist and whatever other features the pharaoh hounds have, then you're going to get it, um, as long as you look at enough dogs. And the DNA will all be mixed, but those traits will be preserved. Okay? And part of the genome then will be preserved also, the, par the genes that actually contribute to those traits. But those genes are a real, real minority of genes. Okay? There are something like 25,000 genes probably in a dog, and maybe 10 or 20 of them contribute to these traits. And so any random piece of DNA in that genome is going to look modern because it's been, there's been so much mixing. But a few of the genes, 10 or 20 or however many genes, are going to be the ancient ones that preserve these traits. Okay? And so that's what he means by an unbroken line from antiquity, but mixing along the way. And the only thing that makes that work is that whenever that mixing happened, there was still selection to choose the, the dogs that still looked like a pharaoh hound, pharaoh hound or still looked like a Norwegian elk hound. All right? Next one. Okay. Cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive mutation if a newborn baby's paternal grandfather and maternal grandfather were both carriers of the mutation. What is the probability that the baby will have cystic fibrosis? So a carrier has one good copy of the gene and one bad copy of the gene, right? And so um, let's say that. Um, and cystic fibrosis is called, caused by a recessive mutation. So I'm going to use the letter F because big and little Cs are hard to tell apart. So let's say that there's this gene, right, and it has a big F or a little F allele. And um, big F is normal. Let's not say normal. Let's say healthy, 
Um, and little, al little f is associated with cystic fibrosis. Okay, but only if you have two copies of that gene, right, that allele. Okay, and so the question is, here's a family. You know the two grandfathers were carriers. What's the probability that the baby will have the disease? Okay, so let's draw a pedigree um, that shows this family. Okay, so that's the baby, right? Uh, grandfather, grandmother, father. Grandfather, grandmother, mother, right? And so what we're told is that the paternal grandfather and the maternal grandfather are both carriers, okay? So their genotypes are big F, little f, right? And that's all we're told. What's the probability that the baby will have cystic fibrosis. So what does the baby's genotype have to be? Little f, little f, right? Okay, so now we just have to figure out the probability that that happens, that this baby ends up with the little f and the little f, okay? So we're not told about the, the grandmothers, right? We're not told anything about the grandmothers. So the assumption we make is that they're not carriers, okay? So what's the genotype of this grandmother? Big F, big F, and this grandmother, big F, big F. And the reason we can make that assumption is that most genetic diseases are rare. Okay, that is the, the cystic fibrosis allele is not common in the population. So if you just take any random person from the population, it's unlikely they're even a carrier. Okay, now if this question were about, say, um, sickle cell disease in African Americans, we'd have to change that assumption because 10% of that subpopulation actually is a carrier. Okay, so you'd have to take that into consideration. But for most genetic diseases, and unless you're told otherwise, you can assume that it's rare, that even carriers are rare. And so if you're not told about someone, you can assume that they're, um, they don't, they're not a carrier. Okay, so in order for this individual to be little f, little f, what do the genotypes of the parents have to be? Both would have to be carriers, right? Big F, little f, and big F, little f, okay? So that completes the genotypes of all the people, and now we just have to figure out the probability that this actually happens. Because you could have another scenario. This, this one could be big F, big, big F. If this father is big F, big F, what's the probability the baby will have cystic fibrosis? Zero, right? Okay, so what's the probability that this father actually is a carrier, given that these were his parents? 50%, okay? Because the mother, this guy's mother, the, the paternal grandmother, is definitely going to give him a big F, right? And there's a 50% chance that the father gives a big F and a 50% chance that the father gives a little F. So that's the probability that this guy is a carrier. Same for this guy, right? Because he has basically the same genotypes in the parents, okay? So what's the probability that they're both carriers? A quarter, right? A half times a half, right? So this part up, there's a one quarter probability, right? And now given that this happens, what's the probability that the baby is little f, little f? We already did this question, except it was red flowers and white flowers, right? It's one quarter, right? Because you have to get that allele from that father and that allele from the mother, okay? So the probability that the baby is little f, little f is a quarter. So the overall probability that the baby has cystic fibrosis is 1 16. Any questions about that? Yeah. So, so basically, the way we, we figure things like this out is we, is we separate out independent events, right? The probability that this father is a carrier is completely independent about whether the mother is a carrier, right? Because they have different parents, right? So we can figure out this part of it and say the probability that the father is a carrier is 50% because in order for it to happen, he has to get that allele, right? And there's a one, one half probability that that happens and one half probability that he gets that one, okay? And the same over here. So the probability that this 
father is a carrier is 50%. The probability that this father is a carrier is 50%. So the probability that both parents are carriers is 25%. One half times one half. Okay. Once we're there, then we have another independent event. The probability that this allele gets passed on to the child and this allele gets passed on to the child. Okay. So we start with one half times one half. Right. And then we add another half because this has to happen. This allele has to be the one that's passed on. Right? And then we add another half because this allele has to be passed on. Right? So it's one half times one half times one, uh, 160. Next one. Okay, so this one. So let's quickly go through this one then, because it's the prelude to this one. So, okay, so your friend studies eggplants, which are like tomatoes, very, very closely related. She hypothesizes that the ovate gene might be responsible for the shape differences between eggplant varieties. So you have a round variety and you have a pear shaped variety. Um, and the reason she thinks that is because that's what's true of tomatoes, right? You have round varieties and pear-shaped varieties, and this gene called ovate is responsible for that difference. Um, she sequences the ovate gene in the two eggplant varieties. In which variety should she expect to find an intact functional ovate gene? And in which variety should she expect to find a mutated non-functional ovate gene? So that basically pretty much just goes back to what we know about tomatoes. Right? And so what we know about tomatoes is that uh, the mutated version of the gene is associated with this shape, and the functional version of the gene is associated with the round shape. Okay? So we're just sort of transferring what we know about tomatoes to this situation. Um, and then what experiment would definitively demonstrate that the shape difference is indeed caused by the ovate gene? You all know this because we talked about it about 40 minutes ago. right? The way you demonstrate that is you take the functional copy of the gene and you put it into the ovate variety and you should get a round fruit. Okay. So the next question. Yeah. Um, usually not, because usually the mutated version is basically inactive. So if you add an inactive gene to a plant that already has an active gene, then it's like you did nothing to it, right? In some cases, a mutation is overactive. And in that case, your experiment would be the right one to do. OK, so the friend's experiment is successful. So she knows that um, the ovate gene causes the differences in shape between the eggplant varieties. Um, and she, know, she now figures out from her sequence that the mutated version of the gene contains a premature stop codon. That is the, you know, the reading, the, the coding sequence of the gene stops too early because it hits a stop codon. Um, she now wants to determine whether there's any evidence that this mutated allele was the target of selection in the past. So what that means is that someone at some point really liked having eggplants that had this pear shape, right? And so they selected that, they bred that. And so she wants to use DNA evidence to see if that's actually true, that someone in the past did that, um, and that the target of that selection process was actually this particular mutation. And so the question is, what experiment would you advise her to do, and what's the expected outcome if the allele was indeed selected? So um, in that lecture, I basically went through how this was done for the Tiosinthe branch gene of maize, of corn. Okay. And what was done there is, is basically the exact same experiment where you have a gene that's associated with a difference between corn and its ancestral species, in this case, Teosinte, right? But it's not any different from saying that it's between sort of an ancestral eggplant variety and a different looking eggplant, okay? Um, and so if you remember what was done there is that the mutation in that case wasn't in the coding sequence of the gene. It was in the promoter area of the gene and it caused the gene's activity to change. 
And so um, we also went over how you get evidence for whether selection has targeted a particular gene. And the way you do that is that that gene should vary very little across the population. Okay? That is, if you take um, any particular species, so take humans, if the, lac if the lactase gene was under selection because we switched to dairy farming and started drinking milk as adults, if that gene was under selection, then you should see very little variation in that gene across humans. Because it, what, what happened was at some point in time a mutation happened and it spread through the entire population because it was advantageous. And it's that spreading process that basically very rapidly makes copies of the same exact allele in every individual in the population. So there's no variation among individuals. But every other gene has variation because that, that selection process didn't happen. So the evidence of selection is, is taking a bunch of DNA sequences from individuals of a population. So you could take a bunch of pear-shaped eggplant and a bunch of not pear-shaped eggplant, get sequences from them, and see if there's a deficit of variation around that premature stop codon. Okay? And what we saw with the Tiacente branch gene was that even if you compared the promoter region to the rest of the gene, the rest of the gene looked normal. It looked like no selection had happened. There was no deficit of variation whatsoever. But around the promoter itself, there was basically no variation in corn, whereas there was variation in Tia synthase. So you'd expect the same exact result, that in this case, there'd be no variation in the, in the mutated varieties. Okay, They'd all share that same exact mutation. But there'd be a lot of variation in the round varieties. And you would have you'd have to have some sequence next door that you were using as a control to say what the normal amount of variation should be. Exactly right. So the la the the absence of variation would be centered around wherever the important mutation was. Okay, and this this is the principle that was used to take just human genome sequences without any information about particular genes contributing to particular traits and take which genes were under selection. Because you just scan along the genome, and wherever there's a dip in the amount of variation you see, you say, that gene must have been selected for some reason. And the genes that come out are things like lactase, things like taste and smell receptors, things like digestive enzymes, uh, things that were associated with the invention of civilization, basically. Want to get one more in? Right, so like the grandparents one? Yeah. Um, well, it becomes a more difficult problem. So uh, let's simplify and just imagine it's just parents that are relevant. Okay. So let's say it's about, um, the question is about, let's say these are both uh, African Americans, right? And the question is about sickle cell disease. And so um, you're told, say, that this father is a carrier and you have no information about the mother. Let's say. Okay. Um, if you were reading the news this week, by the way, there was a big story on um, sickle cell carriers. Did anyone catch it? Anyone catch it? Um, they're considering testing all uh, collegiate football players and other athletes for being carriers for sickle cell disease. And the reason is that um, there have been a lot of deaths recently from like overtraining, you know, hot weather, dehydration, and then collegiate football players dying on the field, practice field because they were overtrained. Um, and there's a big association there between whether the person is a carrier for sickle cell or not. And the reason is that um, normally carriers are OK. In fact, in West Africa, they have a slight advantage because they tend to be resistant to malaria. But if you're overstressing your cardiovascular system, then even carriers can show the symptoms of 